Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this is a video for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. In this video, we're looking at Chapter 6 on Adolescence, and we're looking at Section 2, which is Cognitive Development in Adolescence. The first thing we want to talk about is some of Jean Piaget's research. Remember, we started talking about him in infants on cognitive developmental theory. And in terms of dealing with formal operations, in Piaget's theory, adolescents have, re have reached cognitive maturity. So the formal operation stage, that, that's the ability to deal with abstract concepts, and that's the thing that Piaget was most interested in. The formal operation stage, that's characterized by the capacity for what's called flexible, reversible operations on, on abstract ideas and concepts, so things like symbols and statements and theories, um, they're all part of Piaget's theory. Now, children can begin this phase of formal operations at 11 or 12. Some reach it later, and, and of course, some may never achieve it. But adolescents who are in the formal operation stage, they can speculate about possibilities in their minds. They can test their theories, do a mental test to see if they're accurate. Also, they can understand concepts using symbols that represent something else. So, for instance, you have these enormous uh, algebra equations on the chalkboard behind this um, uh, person. On the other hand, you do have a couple of funny things that go on uh, cognitively. One of them is something called adolescent egocentrism. Um, one part of adolescent egocentrism is, is what they have, for instance, called the imaginary audience. And that's the perception that other people are as concerned with our own appearance and behavior as we are, when the fact is most people don't really care that much. Um, adolescent egocentrism can also include the personal fable, and that's the belief that our way of thinking and emotions are unique, and it embraces the view that an individual is invincible. Um, anyhow, people come to see eventually that they um, are not the center of attention the way they think they are. They're not totally uh, different from everybody else the way they think they are. Um, but these are some of the beliefs that become really prominent during adolescence. Now, some gender differences start to show up in cognitive abilities during adolescence. Now, and again, I'll give the same caveat I've given every other time. These are small differences. Um, they only show up when you're dealing with very large groups of people, and the individual variation is enormous. And so the gender differences are small here. Um, anyhow, females and male adolescents, they don't differ greatly in overall intelligence, but in childhood, a distinction begins to appear in certain cognitive abilities. So, for instance, uh, you can talk about verbal abilities, reading, spelling, grammar, oral comprehension, word fluency. These are all verbal abilities. And girls and women, to some extent, are better than boys and males in verbal capacity at every age level. Um, it, it's unused from, from childhood up through adulthood. And there's a lot of reasons why this might be true. There's some biological, there's some cultural reasons why... Uh, females, girls, and women might excel in their verbal abilities. And there is one interesting thing to point out, and that is in countries where reading is seen as a masculine action, um, boys actually uh, do better in reading ability than girls. And the opposite is true in countries where reading is seen as a female activity. So you do have these cultural and social expectations and stereotypes, and that the personal performance often tends to mimic these uh, stereotypes. Now, how about something called visuospatial ability? Um, what we have here is a series of tasks, the embedded figure task, the water level task, uh, mental rotation, or the Tetris task, I like to call it. And it's visuospatial ability is the ability to visualize, manipulate, and rotate objects in your mind. And males taken as a group, um, as a group, tend to have better visuospatial abilities than females. It starts at around eight or nine years old, and it tends to last through adulthood. Now, there are a lot of possible reasons for this. One environmental theory indicates that gender stereotypes uh, lead boys to play with toys, which develop their visuospatial abilities. You know, things like Legos and uh, uh, and you know, building things. And while well, girls play with toys that don't, you know, for instance, playing with dolls doesn't re doesn't require the uh, visual ability. It does require a social ability, um, and that may contribute to the uh, gender disparity in visual spatial ability. Okay, how about mathematical ability here? And uh, what our slide says is most Americans have different expectations uh, for boys and girls, and 
that can lead to what's called self-stereotyping, where a person actually changes their own behavior, their own preferences, in a way that uh, really falls in line with the stereotypes. So the fact is, for instance, there have been a lot of studies that shown that, for instance, uh, boys and men did better on math than girls and women. On the other hand, what's usually not mentioned at this, well, let me say what happens is because if you take the people, for instance, who get a perfect score on the math part of the SAT, there's a lot more men there than there are women. On the other hand, if you also look at people who did really, really badly, who have serious learning disabilities and cognitive deficits, those are also more often male than female. And so what you have is this, uh, there's a lot more spread in the male distribution. And, and so you find that recent studies show that males and females have equivalent average scores on mathematics on standardized tests. So the, the middle is, is the basically similar for both. Now, there's very different expectations for American girls and boys, and that can discourage uh, women from going into fields like math or science. Um, when, in fact, these gender differences tend to be very small, and again, the individual variation is so much more significant, and there's so much more about individual interest and individual propensity and aptitude that needs to be considered. Okay. Back to moral reasoning. This is Lawrence Kohlberg's work. And uh, in this one, we're talking about the Heinz dilemma, where Heinz, Heinz's wife is sick and she'll die if he can't get a drug, but he can't afford it and he has an opportunity to steal it. And should he or should he not take it? And what we have here are the stage five and six, which are part of what Kohlberg calls post-conventional reasoning. Now, as a, as a quick review, the pre-conventional level, which occurs in, which shows up first in young childhood, uh, the pre-conventional level of moral development is when kids tend to judge right and wrong in terms of personal rewards and punishments, and that's seen as pre-conventional because it's, it's just very self-centered. The conventional level of moral reasoning, which accounts for most moral judgments during adolescence and truthfully for most people, uh, this first shows up during middle childhood, and this is when children uh, and adolescents judge right and wrong in terms of social conventions and rules and laws. Uh, the post-conventional, which is what we have in this one, the stage five contractual legalistic and the stage six universal ethical, uh, moral reasoning is based on a person's own ethical values. So, for instance, um, they see things not in terms of sort of these received laws, but in decisions that they've made their own about what is acceptable and unacceptable. Not surprisingly, adolescents with higher levels of moral reasoning on this particular scale are more inclined to display good behavior. Also, if you take people who are really low, juvenile delinquents, um, some studies show that uh, with juvenile delinquents, you can help develop higher levels of moral reasoning uh, by the use and discussion of moral dilemmas in group settings. Now, a really important thing, anytime you talk about Kohlberg, you gotta bring up one of his students whose name is Carol Gilligan. And because Kohlberg had this system, the, you know, the one, two, three, four, five, six, and he said that men on a whole generally came out at a higher level than women did. However, um, Carol Gilligan was one of the first to say, well, that's only because you put those things in this particular order and said that, yeah, if you put the abstract and non-social at the top, men will generally come out higher. And she refers to that as the ethic of justice. On the other hand, um, Gilligan said, for women, it may be more important to talk about relational issues. And she says, you have the ethic of caring. And when you do that, you switch the order around and women can come out higher than men. And so the, the idea here that, that men may be at a higher level, that's only true if you put abstract as the highest level. Um, and that can really sort of, it can put a damper, it can it can cause a lower view of the stages of moral reasoning that people who have a responsibility for the specific needs of specific other people, uh, which is usually women, um, it puts that at a lower level, which it really is an arbitrary decision. Okay, how about the adolescent in school? Um, Influence of peers and teachers can have a profound effect on adolescence. And what you see, one of the things is that transitions between middle or junior high school and high school, these can be very traumatic events for teenagers. Also, as stress levels rise during these traumatic periods, self-esteem can drop, uh, grades can drop, involvement in school activities can drop. 
And this transition uh, from elementary to middle school in particular is especially hard for girls who are likely going through puberty at the time of the change. Again, they go through puberty before uh, the boys do. And the girls can face more attention and often very unwanted attention from older adolescents, uh, which can create a whole additional level of stress. And so given all of these factors, some schools are implementing what are called bridge programs that can help ease the stress of students encounter when they go th uh, changing from one level of school to another. Speaking of school, we can talk about dropping out of high school because not everybody graduates. And what we have is a rather complicated table here. At the very top, you see that about uh, not quite, uh, these are statistics from 2007, by the way, that not quite 4% of students drop out of high school. Um, dropping out can be a real problem. Uh, not surprisingly, people who drop out of high school are higher risk for unemployment, often end up in low paying jobs. Um, also, now I'm not going to say that there's a causal link here, but the people who drop out of high school are also more likely to be delinquents, um, to be convicted of crimes, also more likely to abuse substances. Um, although those are, being engaged in those things can lead to the dropping out of high school, and so dropping out of high school really becomes a diagnostic criteria, not an explanatory one. Um, there's a couple of things that are good indicators of uh, school dropout. You know, obviously poor attendance is one of them. Uh, but being below grade level in reading is a big predictor of dropping out in high school. So there's an extra emphasis people might want to place on reading ability. Uh, men drop out of high school more often than women. So you see, for instance, that the dropout rate for men is 4.2% as opposed to 3.4% for women. Also, students who live in low-income households. So if we go down here, you see that low-income has a dropout rate of 8.9% compared to 1.5%, just um, one, f oh, if I can do my math here, one-sixth the rate uh, for you know high-income, 1.5% to uh, 89 um, Also, people from urban areas, uh, which is going to be associated with family income. And then you also see that there's some effects for race and ethnicity. And so, for instance, uh, Asian and Pacific Islanders have a dropout rate of only 1.6%, whereas, for instance, uh, Latin American, 5%, uh, and African American, 7.3%. Again, these are confounded with a lot of other variables, but they ca you can see that there are some significant disparities between groups of people. Not surprisingly, here at the bottom, high school students in their 20s are much more likely to drop out. I didn't know anybody in their 20s in my high school but they account for a very small number. You can see in the third column there where it says population enrolled. It's a small number of people that old, but you know they have a 24% dropout rate. Um, a number of programs have been developed to encourage students to stay in school, but they're usually launched too late to prevent dropout, which is uh, really a tragedy. Now we can also look at a career development work experience. And what we have here is several different categories of work. Now, choosing the job or career uh, that we want to pursue after completion of school, that's one of the most important choices that people can make. Adolescents may have career choices in mind, but sometimes a profession won't be decided until college or later, as all of the people who change their major know. Uh, high school guidance counselors can use a variety of career tests, including this one here, which is Holland's Career Typology. Uh, to help students choose a career that's right for them. Uh, students can also make choices that correspond with their interests, abilities, personalities, and hopefully they've also done their homework about job availability, training requirements, and uh, stability of employment, as well as uh, the obvious factor of salary. Now, here's an interesting one about uh, you know teenagers working. Many American teenagers have jobs, and that can actually help shape their uh, occupational development. Now, a lot of them are legally employed, but a lot are uh, not legally employed. They also, they may work too many hours, more than they're really supposed to be doing. And they can also stay up late or they can work in hazardous jobs. And there's, so there's positive and negative results from adolescent employment. Uh, for instance, teens that have a job tend to develop a sense of responsibility. They become more disciplined and they learn, uh, they're more likely to learn to appreciate the value of money and education. Also, they tend to gain positive work habits and values. On the negative side, Teens in low-paying jobs tend to have a very small chance of advancement. Um, also, teens who work more than, say, for instance, 11 to 13 hours per week, they're prone to having lower grades, uh, more likely to show unruly behavior, more likely to uh, substance use, more 
generally have lower self-esteem than those who don't work or who work fewer hours. But again, that's going to be confounded with a number of other things in terms of why these people are working that many hours. Um, parents and educators can try limiting the amounts of hours worked um, and structuring things so that that kind of work is not necessary, especially during the school year, to avoid some of these problems. That's where we'll stop for this section.